The late Monsignor Mario Marini worked nearly 40 years in the Vatican before he died last year, nearly, nearly a year ago. It was in May of last year. He was a personal friend of mine. I knew him for 35 years. In 1996, Monsignor Marini told me when I was visiting Rome, speaking of the Roman Curia, he said, and he made this gesture, our hands are tied. We can do nothing because it is Masons who occupy the key positions. The last time I saw him before he died in October 2008, Monsignor Marini told me, we are under Masonic occupation. How high in the church is the Masonic occupation? Monsignor Marini said key positions are occupied by Masons. Perhaps this would explain why you have the text of the Syllabus of Errors of Pope Pius IX, which is a solemn condemnation, solemn and definitive. You look in paragraph number six, it conforms to the criteria stated in the 1983 Code of Canon Law for an infallible pronouncement that is not quite as solemn as the dogmatic definition, but solemn, sufficiently solemn and definitive that it bears the theological note of infallibility. And we see the condemnation of the doctrine of religious liberty, almost verbatim, almost exactly as that doctrine is set forth as a truth in the Second Vatican Council text. A reversal of doctrine, yet we hear so many times, again and again and again, they will tell us that in the Second Vatican Council we, we, have, we don't have anything that contradicts dogma, we don't have anything that contradicts the, the, the doctrine of the faith, but it must be interpreted according to tradition. Well, that is like taking the 95 Theses of Martin Luther and saying, well, there's no heresy there, but we've got to interpret it according to tradition. The statement is absurd. I won't go too deeply into this because I've already written about this in my book, The Suicide of Altering the Faith in a Liturgy, where the entire history of the church, the tradition of the church and sacred scripture are utterly incompatible with the teaching of religious liberty and ecumenism as set forth in Vatican II. And so we have the tradition and scripture, both. We have the most forceful condemnation of ecumenism made by Pope Pius XI in his encyclical letter, Mortalium Animos. And he said that ecumenism, the, the error of ecumenism is such that it would destroy the church to its very foundations. Yet, since Vatican II, we are told that the church has an irrevocable commitment to ecumenism for the sake of unity. This is truly the diabolical disorientation of the third secret of Fatima. Sister Lucy referred to the diabolical disorientation in the church's hierarchy at the very highest levels. We look in the encyclical letter of Pope John Paul II, Ut Unum Sint, 
And we see that the disorientation was at the very highest level. The disorientation inhabited the mind of the Vicar of Christ on earth, Pope John Paul II. He is the one who declared that the church has an irrevocable commitment to ecumenism. The problem there is that ecumenism is the greatest threat to the church. Ecumenism was created by the greatest, most mortal enemies of the church for the purpose of destroying the church. Ecumenism is the greatest obstacle to unity. And yet, we are told that we must promote ecumenism for the sake of unity. To understand just how absurd is the idea that ecumenism promotes unity, we need only to consider what are the bonds of communion? In what does unity consist? There are the three bonds of unity. The bond of faith. The bond of the sacraments. And the bond of ecclesiastical governance. In the formulation of St. Paul, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. There is the one faith, the Catholic faith, outside of which there is no salvation. Or as the First Vatican Council stated, outside of that faith there is no salvation. There is one religion which is a divine institution. That is the Catholic religion. No other religion on earth is a divine institution. This is why there is no salvation outside of the Catholic faith. Because it is the divine and Catholic faith. Mere human doctrines cannot gain salvation. They do not have the power to confer grace. It is through faith and the sacraments, by the supernatural power of God, through faith and the grace that we receive from Almighty God in the sacraments, that brings about salvation. And so there cannot be communion between the church and any other religion. So there is the bond of faith, and the bond of the sacraments, and ecclesiastical governance. Where there are these three bonds of communion, there is unity. Ecumenism is, as Pope John Paul II, Pope, Pope John Paul II himself declared in Ut Unum Sint, ecumenism had its origin in the churches of the reform the Protestants. We can go back further and we will see that the Kimonism before it invaded the church and before it invaded the Protestant denominations was first promoted by Freemasonry. It is of Jewish origin the idea of natural religion as the vehicle of salvation for the Gentiles. This was the teaching of, of the Jewish rabbis. And the Jewish philosopher Mendelssohn, the, uh, the grandfather of the composer Felix Mendelssohn, uh, wrote this and I provide the, the, the precise quotation of the text in my book, The Suicide of Authoring the Faith in the Liturgy. Now we can begin to grasp what the third secret is dealing with. 
a great apostasy and loss of faith. And what will bring that about? Because the unity that will be created by ecumenism is the unity sought after for centuries by Freemasonry. It is Freemasonry that would set up in the world a one world religion with this Jewish Protestant idea of unity. The idea that all the Christian denominations can coexist in peace and harmony and unity is absolutely incompatible with the Catholic faith, the doctrine of unity, the bonds of communion. It is coherent strictly and entirely logically in the absurd notion of Protestantism that there can be communion in doctrinal diversity. So what unity will ecumenism bring? It will not bring unity in Christ, but what Pope St. Pius X warned about in his 1904 encyclical when he warned about the coming one world religion. This is the great danger to the faith and the life of the Christian that Cardinal Ratzinger was speaking about. This is the great apostasy that Bishop Cosme de Amaral was speaking about, referring to the loss of faith. This is the content of the third secret that has not been revealed. Bishop Cosme de Amaral was so impressed by this great spiritual tribulation, the greatest and worst persecution of the church that there ever will have been or ever will be. And this is what Pope Pius XII was speaking of just after the end of the Second World War when he said in one of his discourses, mankind must soon undergo such suffering such as the world has never seen before. The coming persecution, the coming tribulation will be worse than the great flood and the persecution will be worse than the ancient Roman persecutions.